Señoras y señores, bienvenidos a, nuevamente a mi canal. Hoy tengo a un gran, gran baterista conmigo, un baterista que ha influenciado a muchísimos músicos y es uno de los bateristas que más ha tocado, más ha trabajado como sesionista, ha grabado más de 200 discos. <coughs> eh, es un baterista que ha nacido en Estados Unidos, en Nueva York, ha tocado en bandas como ARC, TNT, tocó en Symphony X, tocó con el gran guitarrista George Lynch, y es más conocido ¿sí? por haber tocado con el gran guitarrista Ingrid Malmsteen, o como lo conocemos acá en nuestro país como Ingrid Malmsteen. Así que es un honor muy grande tenerlo acá con nosotros, al señor John Macaluso. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Gracias, gracias. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me here. It's, a, it's an honor. And uh, so uh, I'm going to start with, with the first question. Uh, let's talk about your beginnings. When did you decide to become a drummer and why? <laughs> Okay, um, I wanted to play guitar. So I went to, um, there was like a catalog that my mother had. You buy clothes, you buy everything, you know? And I saw the guitar section. So I found like an imitation Stratocaster. And my sister was taking me to go buy it. On the way to go buy the guitar, I saw what we call a garage sale. A garage sale is when people put the their couch and all the junk in front of the house and they sell it and in front of the house was a drum set it was a an orange sparkled like maybe japanese drum set i said forget the guitar let's let's get the drums so i went i, I bought the drums i think it was like at the time 20 dollars for the whole drum kit you know i brought it home and ever since that day i've been obsessed and i was 11 years old at the time well 11 years old i started playing An interesting thing, since I bought that orange drum set, 80% of my drum sets through the, my years have been orange. <laughs> I still do it. It's like a little trademark. But yeah, I was going to be a guitar player, but no guitar for me. It's like a science project. I cannot connect with the guitar. I don't feel it, you know? Uh, and let's talk about your influences. Uh, which are your... Main influences on the drums. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the first influence was uh, Keith Moon. I, I was a big Who fan. And actually, I wanted to play drums when I saw the movie Tommy. Mm -hmm. And Keith Moon, there's a short scene where they're playing with the Who, and Keith Moon destroys the drum set. He kicks it and uh, destroys the kid. I was like, wow, that looks like fun. So Keith Moon will be the first influence. And the most important influence in my life was um, Joe Franco. Yeah. Joe Franco wrote the biggest double bass book in the world, double bass drumming. He played with people from Mariah Carey to Twisted Sis. You know, he played with everyone and a phenomenal drummer. And he was my teacher for about four years. And, uh, you know, probably the biggest influence in my life. And then you got Terry Bozio. I've always been a Zappa fan. And Bozio is just incredible drama you know amazing style and the fourth one would be phil collins i'm a big phil collins fan mainly for tuning the drums and sound and uh and groove if you see him live man it sounds like an album he's just an amazing drummer so those four guys i kind of put together that's my salad i mix up the salad and i got my john macaluso style <laughs> excellent Excellent. And uh, besides your uh, mentor, Joe Franco, uh, which was your teacher and, and he obviously changed your, your life in the way you play the drums, uh, you have oh, yeah. other, other drum teachers like uh, Don Famulero, which I made, a, I made an interview with him uh, a few months ah, ago. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah. you also you were a student uh, with Tommy Aldrich and uh, Rod Morgenstein. So I, I want oh, yeah. to ask you, what, what, are, what are the main things that you get from those guys? I, you know, I was, okay. I, was, I was watching your playing, and you had that uh, open, open hand technique, and I, I think you get that from uh, Don Famuleta, I think. I got that from Billy Cobham, all right? And interesting, interesting thing about Billy Cobham, this is an incredible story. I'll try to make it quick. 
but I was playing with Jennifer Batten. She's a guitarist for Michael Jackson. You're Jennifer Batten. Yeah. So we were great friends and we did some tours together. And we did a, we did a couple of gigs in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So we flew to Brazil and Billy Cobham was also on the bill. So I actually got to help Billy Cobham when he did a sound check. Wow. Um, and I sat behind him and watched him do a whole show. And he, when I was a kid, he was my hero. But we went out to, before the gig, we went to lunch. And Cobham, it was amazing. It was like going to lunch with like Batman or Superman. I couldn't believe it was real. And I'm, I got to speak to Billy Cobham. We were talking about Mahavishnu Orchestra. And I said, when did you decide to play open style? He said, I didn't know that I was supposed to put my right hand on a hi-hat. He goes, because in those days, there was no video. And he was a big Buddy Rich fan. So he just said, my left hand is on this side of the kit. It, it's more natural. Just play the cymbal over here and my right hand here. So he was playing Buddy Rich stuff when he was a kid. And he didn't know to cross over. I think that's incredible. It was by mistake. But he influenced everyone. I'm sure Simon Phillips was influenced. And um, yeah, so Billy Cobham was the reason I started to play open. And when I played with TNT... I did entirely open style. I cut my hi-hat stand so I couldn't cheat. I put the hi-hat where it was so low, I couldn't play righty. After I did a couple of tours, I said, wait a minute. Uh, I'm never going to be as good on the left as I am on the right. So the solution was to get an X hat. <laughs> so if it's complicated, I play on the right side. And for straight groove, I, I love hitting the snap with the right. For straight groove... Um, like Billy Idol type beats, uh, I play open style. And then it's an advantage, like Cobham, because the right hand could go around the toms, you know? Yeah. So Cobham was a huge influence. But as far as teachers, uh, Joe Franco, Rod Morgenstein, incredible teacher, incredible drummer. Um, oh, Casey Schwell, Ralph Humphrey, who played with Zappra, he was a big influence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started from Familaro, Jim Chapin, if you know Jim Chapin, yeah. Tommy Aldridge. Jim Chapin. Uh, great Tommy Aldridge. What? Jim Chapin, Jim Chapin changed my life. I mean, in... Uh, uh, who, who did? Jim, Jim Chapin. Oh, incredible, man. He changed my life in the way tell I play the drums in his book. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah, yeah in the, in talking about independence, I mean, the, his book uh, is a, a great thing that helps drummers to get better independence. So, it, oh, yeah, unbelievable. It, obviously, uh, Don Familaro was a, a huge friend of Jim Chapin. So, uh, it, see, it, see. You know, it's, it, was yeah. a, it was an amazing thing. You know, with Familaro, we, I studied about a year, I think, and we never, no, we touched the drum set maybe twice. It was all pad. And um, I was like, Dom, come on, man. I want to get on the kit. And it was like, in time. You know, one of those things. And, uh, but as a teacher, he's great. Because, um, you know, just working on the hands. Constant, constant work on hands, hands, hands. And uh, in the beginning, I was like, come on, this guy's ripping me off. But, but after a while, you realize that it all starts on the pad. Yeah. You know? Uh, Tommy Aldridge was great because Tommy Aldridge is like hanging out with a piece of history. Yeah, of Anything you ask him, he's been there. He knows it, man. And just the, just the stories were worth the lessons alone, you know? And uh, interesting thing about him, he says his father was very strict. He was growing up in Texas and his father didn't want to hear the noise of the drum set. So he would go down in his basement and play with his hands. Mm -hmm. And that's why he did, he didn't get it from Bonham. He said he learned the hand stuff so he didn't wake up the family. So if you see his solo, he's doing the hand stuff. I think that's an interesting story. You know what I mean? Wow, amazing. And Ralph Humphrey, Ralph Humphrey taught me um, a lot about time. Uh, you're a drummer, so you might dig this. Um, have you ever been traveling and you hear your favorite song and then you go into a tunnel and the music cuts out? And you keep trying to sing the song. You want to hear the song. So you start speeding to get to the end of the tunnel. And you get to the end of the tunnel and your timing is off. It might be the chorus, but you, you thought it was the verse. Yeah. So this is the theory of Humphrey. We would put, we, he would put on a song. It could be an easy song, you know, Beatles or Stones. Yeah. 
And he would say, play to the song. And then he would click the mute button and he would turn off the song for about 30 seconds or 20 seconds. And then he would put it back on and he wanted to see if he was still in the spot of the song. Yeah. That's a great discipline exercise, man. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, so many, many teachers, man. Many, a lot of teachers. I was pretty obsessed. <laughs> It's funny because, like, um, I moved out to California. Okay, for PIT, on the cover of the brochure, the cover of the, um, uh, you know, the magazine they send you, the, we call brochure for the school. The cover had a picture of the beach. It had a picture of a guy surfing. And it had a picture of Eddie Van Halen. All right? When I moved to California, Eddie Van Halen has only been there for a half hour, one day, and it was one hour from the beach. So I was like, wait a minute, this is false advertising. <laughs> but it was, it was such an amazing school because it was like a full-time job. You get there at nine in the morning and you go till five o'clock at night and the school's open 24 hours. So you could go at night, you could study videos before videos were big. Uh, they had drum sets, practice rooms and um, incredible school. I mean, Casey Shirell was a teacher. Um, uh, Casey Israel, um, Ralph Humphrey, Joe Picaro, uh, Efren Toro, uh, Gary Hess. There was incredible teach, and it's kind of cool because um, even if you're not into jazz or you're not into Latin music, you took the class anyway because you never know when you're going to use that stuff. Yeah. So it was it, they kind of left it open. If you want to go crazy, we got everything for you. You could learn it, um, or if you want to be particular, you could just study this and that. And the good thing it was, other, unlike Berkeley or another school, it was a one-year school. And it's kind of like, we teach you everything we can, now get out, go to work. I kind of appreciate that. Because in those days, 1986, when you hit age 25, that was considered old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're trying to do something in music. Now it's like, you know, people are making it at 40. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it was a player's school. It was a great, a great school, man. Awesome. awesome. Uh, how, how was your experience joining the band Power Mad? And also, how was your experience working with Nicolas Cage in the movie Wild at Heart? Oh, uh, that was, this is, this, this is a, this is a cool one. Um, okay, Power Mad was one of my first real recording sessions. I got a call one day. Uh, I just got back from PIT. I was back living with my mother, like, uh, most of the drummers at the time, you know? And I got a call. I was playing pool in the basement with my father and I got a call and uh, it was a guy from Warner Brothers Records. And I was like, oh, cool, hey, wow, Warner Brothers. So I, I sound, I try to sound like I was older than I was. I try to sound like I had a big history. But meanwhile, I really has, haven't done much, you know? Um, he said, we got a band and we're having trouble with the drummer. And we heard a lot about you and can you, can you audition for us? Like tonight? I said, okay. Wow. So these guys arrived from there. They came to my parents' house. I had the basement with the drum set. And it was like 11 at night. I mean, they came late because they came from, they came from another area of New York. So the guys were from Minnesota. They brought the producer, Tim Bamba. And they were like, just play. So I was just jamming, and I remember one guy said, play some wailing double bass. So played the double bass. They said, okay, you got the gig. Uh, we got to record an album, a full-length album, and, and we start tomorrow. We start tomorrow. I was like, okay, um, I do this all the time. I'm ready. <laughs> it wasn't true. You know, I knew how to play. But and in, in these days, there was no Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to play a song, you had to play – from beginning to end exactly. with no punches, you know, two inch tape. Um, so we go in the studio. This is crazy. You're a drummer. You'll appreciate this. We go in the studio. It's called record plant studios. It's where John Lennon recorded. And, and as I walked in, Steve Gadd was walking out and Steve Gadd's drums were in the corner. And they said, Steve Gadd on the, on his drums, on the cases. And the whole session, I was just looking at those drums in the corner. They're like, Holy shit. It's Steve Gadd's drums here. So there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. But here's the crazy thing, man. They had their drummer that didn't work out in the studio to tell me what to play. Okay? 
So I couldn't invent my own stuff. I had to play exactly what he wanted. And imagine there's no Pro Tools. So you, I, I try to write everything out. Um, and I would go through a whole take, 10-minute song. And the guy's like, you missed the floor, Tom, on verse one of, uh, of the, this section. Um, dude, it went on and on and on for about three days uh, with this guy. Play this, play this. Uh, you missed my fill. Eventually, the producer was smart. He said, listen, go get a cheeseburger. Come back in a couple of hours. And the producer worked with me. And I, I did as much as his style and his fills as possible. And I did some of my own. So in the end, it took about 10 days. We did the album. And the crazy thing is then they called me for the tour. And I said, why the hell didn't you have me play my own stuff? Because I, I, I'm coming on tour. I could have been doing my own stuff. But anyway, I, I flew to Minnesota, where they're from, and we started rehearsals. And actually, it was weird because I almost gave up the gig. I was having a hard time playing for one hour or an hour and a half. All the You know, now people have different techniques. At the old, I, I was old school. You're really pounding those feet. You have to play. And, and you know, anyway, I actually told them, I said, I'm going to go home. I don't think I can handle this. And I'm not like that. I'm not, I'm, I'm a guy who's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But I was so down. And they said, listen, man, give it one more shot. So we went into rehearsals. The next day I was more psyched mm -hmm. and I stayed with it. And I'm lucky because a day later they got the gig doing the movie uh, Wild at Heart with Nicolas Cage and um, Laura Dern. So I'm glad I stayed because I got to work with Nicolas Cage, Laura Dern, David Lynch. And that was crazy because we flew to California and we, I watched him. I watched him do the whole movie thing. Uh, just that scene we were in took a day and a half, mm -hmm. you know, and, and working with David Lynch was incredible because he improv, he improvs a lot. Mm -hmm. Like Wild at Heart was finished and then he heard Slaughterhouse and he wrote us into the movie. See, he, he delayed the movie because he wanted the band and that song in the movie. So he's like that. He improvs, man. There was a fire down the road, a building on fire. And he stops. He goes, cut, cut. So Nicolas Cage and everybody is like, okay, stop. He says, all the cameras, let's go. And everybody ran down the street and he filmed the burning building. So in Wild at Heart, there's a lot of scenes where you see fire and windows, windows burning. That's from when we ran down the road to film the fire. Wow. So he's he's improvisationalist, man. Is that a word? <laughs> anyway, and Nicolas Cage stayed in character the whole time. So like even even when you it was a break, uh, as hey Nicolas Cage, I'm nice to meet you. He's like hey, nice to meet you too. He stayed like that the whole time. He was Elvis the whole time. So it, it just a great experience, man. Great experience. Both of those experiences. Wow. Yeah. It taught me never to say no with Power Man. It taught me never to say no. And never let them see a sweat. Like if I was in the studio and I couldn't get something down, I would say, wait, wait, guys, hold on a second. I got to fix my pedal. And I would go down and make believe I'm fixing a pedal. But meanwhile, I'm going, what the hell is the chorus? What do I do for the chorus? You know, never let them see you sweat, man. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm actually doing a samba, <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> but making it more metal style. So we, we, we swore to each other. We said one day we're going to do an album again. I went with TNT and after I went with Riot and the whole time we were talking and we were talking on the phone and after playing with TNT and Riot and touring for years, I still was the new guy. You know what I mean? I was always the new guy in these bands. They never let me go. It was like, oh, dude, this album was recorded in 85. So you have to play with the drummer player. Blah, 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 blah. I was a kid, man. I was on fire. I wanted to do my thing. So I started ARC kind of out of frustration. You know, I studied so much. I wanted to use all my stuff. And I was getting frustrated at like. So I said, I'm going to stop my own band. I called Toro. He said, come over here. I got recording equipment. Let's make a demo. So I flew to Norway and we made a demo just instrumental. Yeah. We recorded all those songs in a gymnasium, in the same gymnasium. Wow. And that became the first ARC album. It was a demo, but we used the tracks. Uh, I knew Yorn because um, the TNT guys, we always used to hang out um, in Norway and Yorn would come by and he was a quiet guy. You know, at the time, he was like a quiet guy, but I knew he was a great singer. I heard him sing. Yeah. So we got Yorn to sing on the ARC album. And Tora played bass, but we put a fake name, Jeff, Jeff um, I forgot the name, Scott Paulson. It's, it's a mythical character. It's really Tora Osby playing guitar and bass. We hired a keyboard player, and it was pretty much a trio. Mm -hmm. So that's the first ARC album. It was, it was a demo. It was supposed to be a demo, but we mixed it, and um, it was good enough to put out. And that's how ARC started. Uh, from that, we got a record deal, and we did Burn the Sun. And, uh, you know, that was the whole thing. But getting the Ingbe gig after the first ARC album, it's crazy. Even before ARC, I got a call once, and I got, the voice said, hey, John, this is Ingbe J. Malmsteen. He put the J, right? Ingbe J. Malmsteen. Uh, I heard about you. I want to see if you want to audition for the band. Can you make me a video? I said, okay. I sent the video and he called me back and he said, why don't you twirl? You don't twirl your sticks. Why? I said, it doesn't sound good. I said, it doesn't sound good. And he got pissed. He says, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he never called me back. He didn't call me back. And then years later, um, Joe Franco again called me and said, don't hate me for this, but Ingbe Malmsteen needs a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, I'm totally interested. I love Ingbe. You know, um, I sent them the ARC album and immediately I got a call. This is Ingbe J. Malmsteen. I said, remember me? You talked to me years ago. He didn't remember. He said, is it you playing on that ARC album? I said, of course it's me playing. He goes, can you come down and record my album? He didn't even ask me, do you want to audition? He goes, could you come down to Florida next week and start recording? My life is always this way. It's like, hey, we need you tomorrow. I never get time to rehearse. Uh, so he flew me down to Florida. He meets me. And he's like, the first question was, why did, why did you cut your hair? Why did you cut your hair? He was like pissed that I had short hair. Anyway, um, that's how it started. I got it through the first arc album. And this is an interesting thing. Ingbe, we would always do in soundcheck, we would do Where the Winds Blow. He loved the Where the Winds Blow. Yeah. So pretty much, um, you know, Ark was the thing that changed my life. And uh, it was the only band I started, really. You know? So that's the story with those guys, man. <laughs> and, it, and, it's a, and, a, and it's a great band. I, I really like the music of Ark. It's, it's uh, thank you so much, man. I was, it was my baby. It was kind of a no-rules band, man. You could put sambas. Flamenco guitar, jungle drum and bass, you know? I, I found some Pink Floyd things. In, in the, in the Big time. Can't Let Go. The, first, the, the last song on the um, first album is totally Pink Floyd style or, or vibe, you know? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you how was uh, your experience making the album Alchemy and War? War to, to end all wars with uh, Inve. And, and uh, what, what? you are the, the, the only drummer in the history 
of Green Bay Moms and Drummers that recorded a drum solo in, a, in an album, right? Okay, this is called, the first album with the drum solo is called Alchemy, and the second album I did was um, Water and All Wars, and then it was one called Anthology, where they got the ABBA song. Yeah. But the drum solo uh, on Alchemy, you're going to love this, man. I hope I'm not talking too much, but I think you'll like this story. Yes. Um, drum, the drum solo thing... Uh, with Mountain Steam, we would do eight hours in a rehearsal studio, but we would kind of just drink beers all day, and he would tell stories. And maybe the last hour, we would play a couple of Deep Purple songs. You don't really rehearse Mountain Steam stuff in the studio. You, you rehearse it on stage. And I wonder if he's brilliant and keeping people on their toes by not rehearsing his songs, or he's just lazy. But you don't play Mountain Steam songs until maybe a couple of days before you hit the road. So you, you got to really study on your own. He always says, I wrote these songs. I don't need to rehearse these songs. And we're like, why are we here for three weeks then? <laughs> anyway, like we, we took a break from rehearsal. Instead of drinking beers, we were going to go drink margaritas in a Mexican restaurant. So we um, went to the Mexican restaurant called Paquito's in Florida. And the mariachi guys come walking by the table. They're one paname, one paname, the mariachi, you know? Ingve grabs one of the guitars from the guy and starts jamming. And he does like a Demiola thing, like da -na, da -da. I go, Ingve, that's so cool. Play again. So he starts writing a riff, man. And it went on for like 30 minutes. And the mariachi goes and they they go they go to another table. But the guitar player is like, man, I need my guitar. Can I get my guitar back? Ingve's like, wait a second. So he wrote um, dun, dun, digga, 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 dun, dun, digga, he wrote it at the table at the Mexican restaurant. We went back to his studio and we we recorded it and we used it on the album. And that's what I soloed over that riff that was written in a Mexican restaurant. Yeah. And I thought he was gonna fade it and leave like a two minute solo. It's like ten minutes. I, I I said, oh my god, he kept the whole thing. Yes, I was happy about that. The second album was. You know what it is, man? Ingve is brilliant, and I love him. The problem is, when it comes to mix an album, a lot of the engineers quit or the producers quit, so you never really get the product that you hear when you get your drum sound. It always comes out where Ingve has got his hands on the mix. Or maybe his son at the time was two years old and put his, his hands on the dial. But... um. They always come out mixed really badly. And it's just a shame because the playing and the songs are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the second album, uh, Water and the Wars, I kind of had total freedom because Malmsteen got a new video game. It was like a fighter airplane game. And all he would want to do is sit in the room and play the video game while I was recording. And I was like, cool. It's me and the engineer. So that was more my style on that album. All right. But it, uh, he let me go. He would just come in and go, is it metal? And I said, listen, okay, cool. And he would go back in the other room and stop playing a video game. <laughs> so I had a lot of freedom. I had a lot of freedom. You could hear more freedom. But in the end, man, I don't know who mixes it or what the hell happens, but it's never near good, you know, as the beginning. That, that's a disastrous mix, and it's a shame. I would love to hear that album remixed because it would be beautiful. Yeah, I mean, um, the first experience with Symphony X, I didn't know a lot of their music. When we played Proc Power with Ark, it was Camelot headlining, which is Roy Kahn, the singer, is a really good friend of mine from Norway. And then Symphony X was on the bill, and we were after Symphony X. No, we were before Symphony X with Ark, and it was uh, in Atlanta, Prague Power Festival 2001. So the only time I really heard Symphony X was after we played, I watched them play live, and they were amazing. And I never really listened to them. And then one day I got a call uh, from Michael Romeo. And he said, Jason Rulo has a, a health problem right now. And he said, can I fill in for the Iconoclast tour in South America and Europe? And I said, of course, let's do it. And he goes, you sure you can handle it? Because like, it's in a couple of weeks. And I was like, uh, of course, man, come on. I can do it. You called the right guy. And he goes, if you can't do it, I'm going to kick your ass. I go, no, don't worry, don't worry, man. Send me the shit. Sorry, send me the music. So he sent me some songs, and the first song I got 
was a uh, iconoclast and um, uh, I think Inferno. And I looked at my wife and I said, I'm dead. <laughs> because I mean, the 10 minute songs, it was nine, eight, five, eight, all this crazy stuff. And I'm going, Oh my God, what am I going to do? I, there was a time when I, I felt I was, I was going to cry. I'm going, how am I going to learn all this? Man? I mean, the ballad when all is lost took me a full day. Um, but I shut everything down, no computer, no music, no friends, no nothing. And I just shut my door and I worked and worked and worked on the stuff. And at the time I didn't have a drum set because mm -hmm. my drums were in America. So I did everything just playing on my knees, sitting on the couch. And you know what? It was better because I listened. Yeah. When you've got a drum set, you're going to start to jam. And before you know it, you got limited time. You've got to be on the stuff. So I worked my ass off and I flew to um. I flew to New Jersey and we started rehearsals and we didn't have much time. So it was like really like six, seven hours rehearsing a day. And uh, Russell was on tour with Adrenaline Mob, so he wasn't there. So think about this, man. You got to learn the stuff. You got to remember it. You can't read on stage and the singer is not going to be in rehearsals. So now you got to go practice everything without the singing too. So then Russell came the last two days. And he turned around, oh, you sound good. Okay, let's go home. We're ready. <laughs> and the comfortable thing is they're all amazing people. So they made it fun. And we became great friends. And um, the first gig we did was Argentina, man. We came to you guys. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. For, and uh, yeah, at the time, man, like the crazy thing, I almost got like, uh, I, there was a, a near disaster in Argentina. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be my first time in Argentina my first gig ever with Symphony X. Mm -hmm. We go on stage, but, but for sound check, we were sound checking and I'm still thinking, I'm going, oh my God, uh, song number three, how does it start? We got to really, I, I still, it's not my song, you know? Yeah. It, okay, I love Symphony X now, but at the time I wasn't a fan. So I don't know, the, I, don't, I don't know anything about them. So it's like playing something brand new. Now I'm a huge fan. Anyway, we go on stage in Argentina and I'm doing sound check. And Romeo goes, oh, by the way, man, we have an intro tape. He goes, don't worry. It's like a classical thing. Just wait for it to end and click the sticks and we come in. No problem. Intro tape, intro tape comes on. Curtain opens. Packed crowd. I don't know. 3,000, maybe more in that club. Caracas Club, I think. Well, I forgot the name. Intro tape comes on. But there's a pause in the music on the intro tape. All right? So it's like, da, 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 da. And I go, one, two, three, four, and then bah, da, 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 da. there's another part of the, of the intro tape. So I'm going, oh my God. So that messed me up. It messed me up. I'm going, oh, when does this thing end? Mm -hmm. Again, the tape ends, and I go, one, two, three, four, and I start to play, and the band doesn't kick in. And for a split second, I heard, boo! I heard people for a second, and I almost froze, man. And then I go, you know what? I worked my ass up so hard. I'm not going to let this get away. And I was like, screw everybody. One, two, three, four. And the band kicks in with me. They didn't hear my sticks. Oh. All right. So it was, an, it was almost, almost a near disaster. And at one, two, three, four, we did Iconoclast. And after Iconoclast, we had them. It, 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 everything was smooth. And, yeah. But it could have been a disaster. And, you know, the Argentinian people might have killed me. <laughs> but you, you but it, was, it was great I love Argentina man I look forward to coming back If everything ever gets normal again I would love to come back And even do a clinic or something in Argentina yeah. you know? True, true um, John, it was, it was a, an amazing experience uh, Making this interview I, Yeah, thank you man I appreciate it 100% appreciate it Yeah, it's a tremendous honor for me And uh, I really appreciate your time to do this And, you know, I want to I want to say thank you for everything. Thank you, my friend. We keep in touch, please. And uh, I, want, I want to hear your stuff. And, and I'm going to send you some new stuff. And we'll do that. And then if things ever get better, hopefully I can meet you in Argentina. And we, uh, who knows, man? I just hope things get better so we can travel again. But, okay. You know, maybe do, some, do something over there. Incredible. Yes, we will. We will. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right. All right, John. Thank you for everything and we keep in touch. Man, nice to Perfect. meet you. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much, man. All right. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos. Bye bye.